Hello, Facebook and YouTube. Welcome to Deleted Scenes. We're uh, going to cover, this is where we go over some of the things that didn't make it into Sunday's sermon, or in this case, just things that help inform what we were talking about on Sunday. Because every time I write a sermon, there's always more that I want to talk about. There's always more that we can get into. And wow, the lighting on this side of my face is kind of terrible, isn't it? Well, I'm not in a studio, I'm just in my office, so we'll just keep going with it. So today, what we're going to talk about is the concept of baptism. This came up in our sermon yesterday when I was, it was mainly about Jesus healing people and how that connected with the Old Testament purity laws. But at the end, we connected with the process of purity laws with baptism, and I didn't really get into how I made that connection. So what I want to do today is I want to give some background on the connection between baptism in the New Testament and the law in the Old Testament. Because if you aren't a Bible geek, if you haven't done a lot of studying, but you're reading through the New Testament, it may kind of surprise you when they start talking about baptism. The odd thing about baptism is it seems to come out of nowhere. You know, if you've read the Old Testament and then you go into the New Testament, it begins, depending on the gospel, with some stories about Jesus' Jesus' birth, and then you've got John the Baptist, he goes out and starts baptizing people. You know, why is he baptizing people? Where did this come from? We've never heard the word baptism before in the Bible. So why, why is he going around doing this? Where did it come from? And that's the question that we're going to get into. But as you, when you say, why haven't I come across the word baptism in the Old Testament before? That reveals one of the language barriers that we have with the Bible because the word baptism is actually a Greek word. It's not even a translation. It's what we call a transliteration. See, when they were translating the early English, the first English Bibles, and they wanted to translate this word, baptizo, they had to choose, they had to make a decision how they were going to turn it into English. But the problem is the word bapto means to dunk. It actually comes from the word for dunking materials when you were dyeing them. And the word baptizo, the baptism comes from, is actually to submerge, uh, to drown, you know, hold it down long enough to kill it. And that's where a lot of Christians uh, return to the idea that you should baptize people by submerging them in water. The problem is a lot of churches weren't submerging people. And so if they translate the word into English as dunk, like they translate every other word into English, that would cause some conflict. So in order to avoid conflict, they just kept it as the word baptism. And so part number one, the reason why you don't find the word baptism in the Old Testament is because it's a Greek word. And the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So you've got this Greek word, baptizo, Uh, the Old Testament is in Hebrew. And so the question is, how are we going to bridge this gap between these two different languages? How would we be able to find this concept, this Greek concept, or this Greek word, in the Old Testament that's written in Hebrew. And this is where we bring in a very important historical document that most Christians don't know a ton about. And it's called, is this my best marker? Yes. It's called the Septuagint. And that word is actually a Greek word that connects to the number 70. So sometimes you'll see it abbreviated with the Roman numerals for 70, LXX. So what is the Septuagint? Why should I care about the Septuagint? Well, the Septuagint is a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So they translated, before Jesus' lifetime, they translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And they called it the Septuagint, or we call it the Septuagint. They called it the Bible. Okay, so about 100 years before Jesus' lifetime, they translated the Old Testament into another, the first time they'd ever translated scripture into another language. 
and I translated it into Greek. And because most Jews, more Jews spoke Greek than spoke Hebrew, this became the standard Bible of the time. This was their King James Version. And so the interesting thing is when you read in the New Testament and they're quoting from the Old Testament, they're not actually quoting from the Hebrew. Most of the time in the, Old, in the New Testament, like when Jesus or Paul quotes from the Old Testament, they're actually quoting from the Septuagint. Now, why does this matter? Why is this helpful? Well, because if I want to know how this word, baptizo, connects to words in the Old Testament, this Septuagint gives me a link because it shows me how people who, see, both these languages, they're ancient languages, but the Septuagint, it shows us how people who actually spoke both of those languages connected them together. How did they translate Hebrew concepts into Greek? Well, we have that right here in the Septuagint. And so this is a really important tool that we use to help connect the Old Testament with the New Testament. You'll also see it in the footnotes of your Bible every once in a while because this is such an old translation that it's older than our Hebrew manu than a lot of our Hebrew manuscripts, and so we can use it to make our tra our translations of the Old Testament more accurate. So, when we use the Septuagint, how does that help us with figuring out where baptism connects with the Old Testament? Well, the word baptism actually occurs in the Septuagint, and it's in Second Kings chapter 5, which is the story of a man named Naaman. Naaman is a commander of the army of Syria, and he has leprosy. So he goes to the prophet Elisha and, for healing, and Elisha tells him to go and dip himself in the water, seven, in the Jordan River, seven times, and it will clean away his leprosy. Well, in in the Septuagint, when he goes to dip himself, it says he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. The Greek word in the Septuagint is baptize. He baptized himself seven times in the water, in the Jordan River. So how does that help us? Well, because it gives us a strong connection in the Jewish mind of the time between this practice of baptism and this ceremonial washing for a leper because this is not the first time in the Old Testament where we see a person with leprosy being told to go wash himself. If you rewind farther back into Leviticus, you'll find the laws for people who have leprosy. And the law is that you have, if you have leprosy, the, the priest will check you and, see, and identify the leprosy and you have to leave the camp. But if you're ever cured, then what you do is you present yourself to the priest again, and he will inspect you. And if he finds no leprosy, if he finds that you're cured, then he gives you the sacrifice you have to perform. And then in Leviticus 14, it says, this is what you're supposed to do if you're a cured leper after you perform the sacrifice. And the priest shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash all his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe himself in water, and he shall be clean. And after that he may come into the camp, but live outside his tent seven days. And on the seventh day he shall shave off all his hair from his head, his beard and his eyebrows. He shall shave off all of his hair, and then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and he shall be clean. So, and it isn't just with leprosy, but frequently in the Old Testament, what happens if you've been ceremonially unclean is that the last step in your cleaning process, when you have, when the disease has left you uh, and you're ready to come back, the last step is this purifying bath that you take. And what it does is it, it it's the last step of, of declaring that you have been cleaned of all your impurities. So what then happens in, in between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that there's these groups who are waiting for God to come back, and they're waiting for his kingdom to return, and they're thinking, we need to be clean. We need to make sure that we're clean before God comes back. And not just from our physical impurities, but also from our spiritual impurities. We need to be clean from our sin. And so they start connecting this practice of washing your body to uh, 
after you're, when you become ceremonially clean, and they connect it with becoming morally clean. That when I repent, when I've turned away from my sins, I symbolize it or I mark it by being baptized. And it shows that I'm clean again, that I've been healed. And so going into the New Testament, when, when John starts talking to people about how they need to repent and be baptized, this is language that they're familiar with because it connects with their Old Testament practice of recognizing that you're clean by being baptized. So as Christians, then, when we want to understand the significance of baptism, it connects very strongly with this legal precedent in the Old Testament. What it essentially says when you're baptized is the last step of this process whereby God declares you to be clean. You know, Jesus saves you, he cleanses you from your sin, and in the Old Testament logic, the last step of what you do to certify to, that you are clean is that before the people you are washed. And it shows that you've, your impurities have been taken away. That's the message of baptism. That's what baptism does for us. It's this last step in this process to, of being purified. And it gives you that, that physical moment to point to, to say, this is, this is when I know that I became clean. So that's how we get the old te the connection between the Old Testament concept of ritual washings and the uh, and the New Testament concept of baptism. It is actually a very Jewish idea, but in order to make the connection, we use one of our most important biblical studies tools, which is the Septuagint. And I, I'm not saying that in order to understand the Bible as a regular person, you need to have a copy of the Septuagint or you know, be able to do all this stuff. But I think it just helps to kind of know some of the background on how we make those connections and how we know what, how the, the Greek culture and language of the New Testament connects with the Old Testament. I hope this was helpful. And uh, this Sunday, we're going to be moving into the next sermon in our series. We're going to be talking about exorcisms and how Jesus cast out demons and what that means for his view of what the kingdom is. So uh, we'd love to see you there. And uh, then I'll see you here next Monday as we do another deleted scenes. It should be really interesting as we get into the Old Testament view of angels and demons and the spiritual realm. So I'm really looking forward to it. Hope to see you then.